I think attendance has sort of stabilized, so I, th I think we can start. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Root, and I am the speaker of the Penn Political Union. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, and a special thank you to uh, Nadia. Um, I'm going to basically explain uh, the format of the event, uh, but first I would like to introduce uh, our, our guest. Uh, Nadia Tol Tolokonikova is a Russian conceptual artist and political activist as a member of the street art collective Vaina and a founding member of the uh, feminist protest punk rock band Pussy Riot, Nadia is known for her political activism, bringing attention to issues including LGBT rights and human rights violations, and of course, feminism. Uh, Nadia's anti-Putin political work led to her imprisonment in 2012. Um, this event led to international media attention and outcry. Shortly after her release in December 2013, she announced the opening of the independent news service and media outlet Media Zona, which reports on Russian, Russia's courts, law enforcement, and prison system. We are very, very grateful to have Nadia here with us today, and I really look forward to the discussion that we will have. Um, so I just want to give a brief overview of how the event is going to run. Um, we will have about uh, 45 to minutes to an hour of questions posed by our caucus chairs. I'm hoping for a little bit of an interactive format. Um, so there's going to be discussion uh, with Nadia and between Nadia and our caucus chairs. Um, and this will be followed by um, about 30 or so minutes of questions from the audience um, where you'll be able to ask questions. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to it, this event. Um, I'm very excited. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to also introduce our caucus chairs. Um, if you guys would like to just quickly say hi, introduce yourselves, um, say what caucus you represent, that would be great. Hi everyone, my name is Javier. Uh, I'm the Centrist Caucus Chair. I'm a senior at Penn and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Hi everyone, my name is Haven. I'm the Liberal Caucus Chair and I'm also a senior at Penn. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I'm Michael. I'm the Progressive Caucus Chair, and I'm a junior at Penn. Really looking forward to this. Hi, I'm Adam Robbins. I'm a Libertarian Caucus Chair. And uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. It's good. It'll be a good discussion. Unfortunately, our conservative caucus, Conservative Caucus Chair could not make the event today, but I'm hoping for a wide range of diverse viewpoints anyways. Um, uh, with that, I would like to ask the, the first question, um, sort of to just start us off. Uh, Nadia, what do you see as the biggest threat to democracy in the world today? Mm -hmm. um, many politicians seem to love um, and praise authoritarian leaders. And uh, guys, I really want to um, thank you for getting rid of, rid of Donald Trump because he was uh, one of those people who showed this trend um, really visibly. And uh, he said multiple times that you know, Erdogan is a good leader and Kim Jong-un is a great leader of uh, his nation. Uh, Putin is a strong leader and strong hand. And um, yeah, who else? Anyway, he was, uh, he was just like uh, nonstop praising all these uh, people who I see as authoritarian, um, misogynist uh, leaders um, with uh, really uh, backward thinking um, values. Um, sorry, my English is not perfect always, but um, I'll try to be um, best as I can. Okay, so that, um, and, and something that um, I've, so I've been reading some academic researches on what's happening in the world because it like, it seems to, it seems to be connected somehow, like one thing with another, like Viktor Orban in Hungary and um, Brexit in, um, in the UK and Donald Trump in the United States. Um, it, it's, it, it, you can say that it's the same, like the same things, but uh, definitely for the sake of political science, it's cool to find um, the common thread and find to define uh, it as a trend and um, yeah so some scholars say about the third wave of um, uh, authoritarianization uh, where uh, in democratic countries like United States presidents or <clears throat> the person who used to be your president uh, he 
he's still president technically, right? Um, <laughs> Donald Trump, he was demeaning, diminishing the importance of uh, free speech, of free press, of uh, public criticism of public figures. Um, he was diminishing um, the, the importance of checks and balances. So yeah, I, I feel like the, the, important, the biggest threat to democracy is um, no surprise, this uh, third way of, of, way of uh, authoritarianization, which is like, which looks really different from those that we've seen before. And a lot of people, they would say, oh yeah, but Donald Trump doesn't look like Hitler. But yeah, he doesn't, have, he doesn't have to look like Hitler in 2020. He uses different set of tools and the same thing comes to, the same thing about Vladimir Putin. He still claims that we live in democracy. He still claims that we have, um, we have liberal values, that he still claims that we have free elections. He still claims that we have um, all the rights for LGBTQ plus community. But the thing is, the thing, the like, specific thing about this third wave is that um, they deny, um, the autocrats deny stealing rights from their citizens, uh, while on paper, they still have all those rights, but they're just not being um, executed. Thank you. That's a very informative answer. Do any of the caucus chairs have follow-up quest questions or um, would like to add something? Go right ahead, Michael. Yeah, um, so despite obviously receiving fewer um, popular votes in the last election, Donald Trump was elected by a large contingency of the country in 2016. I'm curious what you think kind of the underlying causes of this resurgence are, um, whether it might be like discontent with how things were run before or some, um, you know, backlash. I I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Well, it's important to notice that I'm not an American citizen, and I didn't have, uh, uh, I didn't have, you know, I, I I didn't live here for a long time, never. But um, so, what what can I say? Um, I thought um, it was generally people's dissatisfaction with mainstream, but but politics, um, mainstream political spectrum that um, was. Um, um, that was presented by people like Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden during these elections. And um, I'm sure you know um, so many people who voted uh, not for Joe Biden, but against Donald Trump. And um, Pussy Riot were one of those people who never, never ever said thing like uh, vote for Joe Biden would be, always would be like, we, if you hold an American passport, if you can vote, please uh, vote against Donald Trump. And I know um, like people who I absolutely adore, like Noam Chomsky, they um, 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 they had the same opinion. Um, I think um, people voted for Donald Trump because they were um, dissatisfied with uh, the way how a mainstream politicians who stayed in power for dozens of years uh, presented them uh, or actually did not present them. Um, you know, the, all those issues with uh, politics being um, actually um, corrupted by big money who is baking, uh, who is ba backing the uh, politicians. All those things there are, um, they're obvious for people that people are not stupid, though, like by some politicians think that people are stupid, people are not. And they see that it's in fact, it's corruption. It's corruption in a way that it's different than in Russia, because in Russia, it's like literally one, I don't know, um, <clears throat> in Russia is more obvious, right? In, in uh, United States as part of uh, the law, but um, I feel like uh, people have a lot of dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with that. And also, you know, um, politicians not addressing issues like healthcare and um, education. Um, I feel like there were uh, a demand for a person who would show middle fingers to the system and it was Donald Trump. It could be Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Sort of on the same line and in, in sort of a, a follow up to that. If we look at, at Russia, um, Putin's approval ratings are, are usually really like high. Do you think those are those accurately 
Yes. Hi. <laughs> um, do you think those accurately uh, reflect the uh, actual views of the um, populace? Um, and if so, or if not, what do you think is going on? Do you, do people support his policies? Do people tend towards author authoritarianism because they like the strength of a leader? What, what, what is your perspective on this? Well, in the very beginning of Putin's rule, uh, according to um, sociologists um, who, who made a lot of researches with Russian people, there, there was a demand for the strong hand, indeed, because 90s were kind of um, fucked up time that I personally loved because it was my childhood, but also it was, you know, uh, the gay culture was blooming and half of Russian pop artists, they were uh, openly gay or queer. And you know the most um, the most known uh, band um, in the West from Russia from that time from the beginning of uh, 2000s actually is Tattoo, uh, two lesbian girls um, supposedly lesbian girls. Um, anyway, I love 90s, but uh, people who were older than me they didn't enjoy 90s so much. And partly, um, I've been talking with a lot of uh, older people, including my parents. I think they didn't enjoy. Um, the, the shock economy too much because uh, they, uh, the transition between, um, between socialism or state capitalism, I don't know, like whatever you call it, USSR, the transition from that economy to um, the free market economy was so um, sudden and, um, and basically a lot of people uh, were left with nothing um, and so, so many Say, most of the people, including my parents, they lost all their savings and uh, money uh, stopped, uh, stopped having any value. So that was a big, um, uh, that was a big shock for, for all Russian people. So, and um, having that together with the president who in his second term started to feel really sick, Boris Yeltsin, who had problems with, with alcohol, it all brought um, Russian people to the, to, to this, Okay, well, some Russian people, the majority of Russian people, brought them to um, um, to, to wishing to, to wishing this strong hand. But um, I feel like after um, after a few Putin's uh, Putin's terms, less and less people started to support this concept of the strong hand because um, because because the country became slowly became richer and I feel like people started to have more um, um, demand for real democracy and less demand for the strong hand. And um, on the one hand, we had bigger, um, bigger amount of people wanting to have real democracy and real, real rights, not just on paper, real fair elections. And on the on other hand, Putin um, was becoming more and still is becoming more and more, um, basically he was consolidating his autocracy. So what we're seeing right now in 2020, um, not a lot of people actually do want to have the strong hand in power. Um, and it happens because of various reasons, partly just because, uh, just because of the natural generational changes. So some of those people who were really, um, who really um, like spent most of their lives in Soviet Union and were really old in, in the beginning of um, this century, they are um, not participating in politics, some of them died. And um, there is a younger generation who, were, who was born under Vladimir Putin and um, the people who are 20 and younger, and um, they are mostly um, not fans of Putin's rule because they see that our living standards are falling down, especially after 2014 when Putin annexed Crimea, when Putin started war in Ukraine, and we saw the Western sanctions. And in response, um, instead of protecting Russian people, Putin has decided to do completely insane thing. He introduced his own sanctions on his own people. So now we cannot import food from um, from Western countries, um, well, from, from, yeah, from, from Europe, uh, United States, Canada, Australia. And so if my family wants to eat cheese when I come from Paris, I, I put them in the bag in my suitcase and I'm, I'm, I'm being really scared because if they will um, find on the border that I'm bringing the cheese, I can be fined for that. 
So, you know, he's like Putin is getting older, but I mean, not all old people are uh, mm, autocrats. Okay, but but with Putin, but with Putin, for whatever reason, it is true. He's getting more strict. He's getting less smart, I would say, because he's using more um, prohibiting prohibiting measures and he's oppressing people openly. Whereas before, I think he behaved smarter and he uh, he actually was able to convince a lot of people that we do live in democracy and. Uh, most of Russian people, Russian people do not think right now that we live in democracy. And regarding polls, um, well, in fact, Putin's approval ratings are falling down and this year they are pretty low historically, that they're hitting the historical lowest point, which is, uh, which is a new thing for my country. Um, and also talking about um, polls uh, in authoritarian country, you always have to know that people are saying what they're um expected to say and they might not think that but they are maybe not even consciously but some so, somehow scared of repercussions that may follow we you know it's like it's pretty different legal system um that we live in and um there is no such a thing as uh you know like uh, th so basically when you say something and it's supposed to be anonymous nobody guarantees you for real that it's going to be anonymous because it can it can end up in your local police station and then later you will be the one who will have problems because of your opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do any of the pocket chairs have follow up questions or want to ask their own question? Uh, I can I can go. Um, you briefly talked about how uh, Trump is authoritarian, um, but just thinking about the United States broadly where would you put the US on a list of least authoritarian countries in the world? And why would you put it there? I, I don't think I have uh, knowledge good enough to actually actually do that because I don't have uh, political scientist education and, um, um, and I'm not a Freedom House organization. Uh, but, you know, seeing it, uh, seeing your country from afar and reading it uh, about the United States and Russian news, I can, I can see that your guys' system of check and balances is, is in a good shape. But um, what I've seen from my experience that uh, any system of check and balances can be uh, eroded over years. And when Putin came to power, we did not have perfect democracy, we did not, but we do definitely were in much better shape. So I, I, know that, I know that it can be taken away from you faster than you think, but I can I can give you any exact numbers or results if you want to hear from me, <laughs> because in the end of the story I'm an artist. <laughs> no, I mean I wasn't like I wasn't specifics. I mean I was just thinking like kind of just like broadly loosely thinking about it. Maybe like you the UK number one like the least like just like where would you think like top ten mm -hmm. like where where would you put the US? Mm -hmm. Uh, the thing that's really confusing for me uh, in the United States are actually two things. The first is great inequality, great financial inequality, and I um, I don't really believe in rights that are not anyhow um, um, supported by the economic base, uh, because if you don't have um, money to uh, to, to, to to entertain your right, I, I mean, basically, if you have to work at seven jobs just to keep your family afloat you don't really you're you're not a real citizen because you don't have time to learn about your political system and you never have time to educate yourself and your family good enough uh, about your political choices so you can be easily manipulated so i believe that inequality is a big threat to any political system and i see that happening in the united states and that's um weird and because it's one of the richest countries on earth um and the second thing uh, is big prison population. Um, and those people who uh, ended up in prison, they are not voters uh, as well. And um, I feel like for um, criminal justice system uh, in the United States for me is a big um, mysterious thing, honestly, because I don't really get why so many people end up in prison because of, non, um, uh, because of crimes that are non-violent, right? And I feel like, if if those two things will be uh, somehow solved, 
inequality and um, overcrowded prisons, then um, then the United States would be a much better democratic system. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry, mind if I ask a question? Um, uh, you talked about in your New York Times piece, the slow erosion of democracy. And I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit more about that, like what that was like in Russia and like what lessons other countries can learn from that? Mm -hmm. um, well, I have childhood memories from that time and, and things that I'm reading right now, um, retrospectively in articles. But um, when Putin came to power, to me and my family, it was kind of obvious from the from the very first second we saw him because we knew that from we could not expect <clears throat> anything um, in terms of liberty, right? Coming from an ex KGB agent, and there is no such a thing as an ex KGB agent because they're still a KGB agent for life, basically. And the problem with KGB agents is that they see the world in black and white, and in that sense, Donald Trump is really like Vladimir Putin because he sees where the, the world in binary um, oppositions, like, you know, you're dominate or you're, you're being dominated or you're dominate. You, you uh, win or you lose, you know, things are black and white, you're poorer, you're rich, uh, there's nothing in between. So for Putin, it's kind of the same. He has to always prove that um, he is, he's winning and uh, he and nobody can criticize him and I think it was the first thing that became obvious uh, after after a year of uh, living, with, living with, with Vladimir Putin that um, he does not stand any criticism um, and for him it was uh, easier to go against his critics as uh, for Donald Trump to go against his um, and he didn't have to go in court even um, he uh, he would just use instruments of um, um, of uh, government machine that was his in his disposal, and um, I would say that the um, attack on a big network um, TV um, network stations were the first signal uh, that something is happening, so something is wrong, uh, it, and so there was a there was um, there was a critical report on a TV station. The next day, the station was raided uh, by uh, by red police, and the owner of this TV station was um, uh, was was sent to prison briefly. And then he was threatened that he if he's not going to uh, if he's not going to stop his work on this TV station, he's go he will go to prison for real. So just a physical intimidation of the of the, of your critics um, and this. Second um, big signal for everyone was um, uh, Khodorkovsky. Uh, and when Khodorkovsky, he, uh, the person who um, who used to be, I mean, he's still a Russian oligarch. I mean, probably you know who Khodorkovsky is. And he is, uh, he was a real Russian oligarch because he went, uh, he went against Vladimir Putin. In early 2000s, uh, he was the one who was uh, sponsoring, who was funding political parties who would oppose Putin. And Putin made it clear that he's not going to, uh, he's not going to tolerate it. And Podarkovsky went to jail for 10 years and he was released in the end of 2013, almost at the same day when Pussy Riot were released, right before the Social Olympics. Um, so yeah, destruction of media, which is the fourth power, the fourth pillar of uh, check and balances system. And, um, um, physical intimidation of political opponents, um, and it was not. Um, and you probably you probably heard about um, all this series of mysterious murders and poisonings of journalists who were working on um, on topics that were not comfortable for the government, including including Anna Politkovskaya, um, including um, some of people who happen to be my. Um, close colleagues like um, Mikhail Bekitov uh, e, uh, and um, Anastasia Baburova. Those people were anti-fascists uh, and uh, they were working in um, media support and uh, legal support of um, anti-fascist movement. So those people were killed not directly by the government by, but by the right-wing um, paramilitaries who 
later, uh, we found out, the court found out, that actually those paramilitaries were linked with the Russian uh, administration of the president. So, yeah, things like that. Thank Did you. I answer your question? Thank Even. you for your answer. Awesome. I can I should I can just go on, but I think we should move to other questions. But yeah, this is my this is my favorite topic. This is my most favorite topic and the least favorite one. Um, there is a, a question from the audience, but um, before I move on to that, do any of the other caucus chairs have uh, questions sort of on on this this topic? Can I ask a follow up? Okay. Uh, so my question is, so like all, all the, you know, the repression you're describing, the sort of retribution and sort of, you know, some extreme, some extreme, you know, in America, like we all think, you know, like it's horrible, it must be terrible, but I wonder, sort of what is the perception in Russia? Because you paint a picture of there's certainly people who are sympathetic to you, sympathetic to opponents uh, of the regime, but they're also probably like older, you know, conservatives, people who like still quite like Putin. So would they say that, like, you know, would they, like, not believe that Putin does these things? Or would they say he does it, but he's justified? I guess, how do, like, how, how are these things viewed from the inside? Is it viewed as, like, a cost of doing business? Or is it, you know, or do people just not know about it? So I guess I'd be interested to see what people across the Russian political spectrum think. Um, and it's fairly clear mm -hmm. what people here would think. But. Um, I think you need to know one thing about Russian conservatives. Um, there is, um, so when you talk about Russian conservatives, it's actually really, really small, um, it, it, incredibly small amount of people. For real, those people who you refer as conservatives in Russia, they're not the same as conservatives here in the United States, right? Because in the United States, people, they, they, they really, uh, they, they would march, uh, uh, at rallies against abortions and uh, they would be like really religious. And that's not the case in Russia for, uh, because you need to know about post-Soviet human um, that we are pretty cynical about politics and about religion too, because we've seen so many, um, um, so many ideologies changing one another, so many governments changing one another, so we don't really trust anyone anymore. And um, when a new person comes and they promise something like stability, like so Putin's pro biggest promise was stability. And for most of the people, uh, they were, they didn't care um, what, what were his values. He didn't, honestly, he didn't have any values when he, he, he came to power. In the beginning, he wanted, he wanted Russia to be part of NATO. And then when um, when NATO told him that no, and and when uh, when it turned out that it's really difficult to be friends with Europe without actually caring about human rights, he turned against them and he behaved like you know like that offended kid on the playground, being like, oh, if you don't want to play with me, later I'm taking my toys, and I'm not playing with you. So um, his values are constantly changing and. Um, his approach is like purely practical and his biggest inspiration is money and power. But for people, what matters is as long as he promises stability and that there is not going to be any revolution and the, the money will still mean, I mean, like, but the money will still cost like the same as yesterday, they'll be fine with this. Um, and regarding political murders and everything, um, I think they, they just don't talk about it too much. And um, I guess if you, um, if you ask them about this, they will be like, they will be, their answer will, will, will be cynical. They will be like, oh, but all politics is a dirty thing. So it happens, you know, shit happens, people die. I have a, a follow up to that. Do you see uh, Russia becoming more democratic over time or, becoming a democracy in the near future or is it going to have to wait until uh putin dies or or will someone take on the mantle after putin what do you think is is going to happen it's always a question with a dictator um or if it's um autocrat um like does have um um does lukashenko have to die to um, to make Belarus free. So it's uh, ultimately up to people from Belarus to decide if they feel like it's enough of them and they, 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 it's enough 
but and they don't want to live with Lukashenko anymore. I feel like I feel like they can overcome it and they can make a revolution. And the same thing with Russia. Honestly, if you if you ask a person from Belarus, um, even I don't know eight months ago, six months ago, um, could something like that like big revolutionary events, people refusing to leave the street and Lukashenko, the dictator who stayed in power for over 20 years, of Lukashenko almost leaving the office, um, I would think that even uh, opposition leaders in Belarus would be like, oh, you're crazy. <laughs> Nothing like that could happen because we are oppressed. Um, our political leaders are in jail and um, and people are numb. They're they're not going to do anything. And then, you know, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they just uh, uh, showed up in the street. So you never know, it's history, you cannot predict it. But um, what uh, what political scientists say, and what socio uh, sociologists say, that um, protest and um, discontent moods are growing up, growing in Russia, and, um, and yeah, partly because we, we see more young people who just unnaturally lean towards more democratic, inclusive, progressive values, and they share the same internet with you guys, and they they see um, they see the same music videos as, as you see, and they follow the same uh, meeting leaders as uh, AOC and Greta Thunberg. So we we're part of the same political culture as the whole world, uh, thankfully to. Um, um, internet that made things really global. Global, um, but um, so partly because of that, and partly because I think even older people they're starting to question uh, Putin because uh, recently he raised um, retirement age, and um, and 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 the salary is not, is not so good that the average salary in Russia. And for uh, older women, it's really difficult to find job uh, and because of retirement age going higher um, and because of sexism that is not somehow, so we don't have any rules that protect women um, in general. And uh, older women after 50, they, uh, they're under the biggest threat because because nobody would want to hire them and they still don't get to, get to enjoy uh, their retirement benefits. So um, I would still, uh, I would say that across all ages, we see um, dissatisfaction with Putin growing. So maybe, maybe something will happen before he dies. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, yes, Haven, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask, in a system where it's hard to trust the things around you, how do you get up uh, what the truth is. Hmm. Checking. Well, I mean, the, I guess the same thing as um, in the United States or any other country, because uh, I feel like the problem of fake news is not unique to Russia. And in a way, in Russia, it's even easier to recognize it because, you know, if it, if it comes from this, uh, like, you know, channel number one, uh, then it means that possibly, like, most likely it is a lie because it's a government propaganda channel. Uh, so, you know, just checking um, checking sources where you get the info and making background checks on journalists uh, who you read. And also, you know, thinking about their, uh, their political agenda because uh, obviously everyone is biased, everyone, but if you just, if you just, if you know uh, which, which political agenda uh, this media outlet has uh, it's easier to understand what is uh, what is true and wh what comes just from from their um, political um, imagination. <laughs> so I kind of want to shift gears a little bit more to your um, political activism um, and I'm going to go with a question from the audience. Um, Michael X. Deli Carpini asks uh, well, says, thank you for what you do and what you have sacrificed. Pussy Riot is at the forefront of a kind of, quote, performance protest um, that has been very effective. Uh, can you talk about how you developed and decided to use your talents to do this? Um, what were you and others hoping to achieve? Um, and do you think you, the broad you of these the people who uh, participate in, in performance protests are succeeding? That's a great question. Um, 
to me personally, it was uh, it came really naturally because um, I always wanted to be two things in life. I wanted to be an artist and I wanted to be an actress. And uh, so since early age, I, I just knew that I'm going to somehow put them together and make them work for me and for people around me. And uh, I, I would say that it's um, it's a pretty it's a natural uh, part of Russian culture. Uh, if you take a look at Russian art in the beginning of the 20th century, you see that a lot of um, amazing avant-garde artists, they were um, really political and they had really progressive political values for their time. And they were, their job was to try to find ways how to promote political values they had through their art. And they were finding like really interesting and non-trivial ways how to do that. And if you see how Mayakovsky, the poet, uh, crafted his word to promote his political ideas, then, you know, you, I was growing up reading uh, Mayakovsky. It was part of uh, my school program. So I thought, yeah, I mean, maybe, um, maybe they didn't have luck with political system where they ended up because I'm not a big fan of Bolsheviks for sure. Um, they did not have luck with that, but maybe we can we can continue at least their their approach and their their methods because they they by themselves they were not autocrats. They had amazing ideas and they wanted to use art to promote these ideas. So um, as a Russian person uh, who loved avant garde, to me it was a natural thing to do. And um, art is a good way to amplify your voice when you when you don't have. Um, when you don't have a lot of supporters. And we did start um, at, at a pretty gloomy place, I would say. In 2011, when they started Pussy Red, it was not popular to be political activists. Definitely there were political activists, but most, most of the normal people, normal people, they looked at us as weirdos. It was not cool, it was not fashionable, it was not sexy. You couldn't get laid if you're a political activist. So our goal was to become, um, is to is to be, to put it uh, to move activism to the mainstream, and so it didn't look like we are going to succeed, honestly, because we we um, we could hardly gather three people for our first performances. It was just me and my friend Kat, with whom we started Pussy Red, and we created this whole. Um, basically it was a fake movement in the beginning. We had to make people believe that we are the movement and we were not, that people didn't really want to fuck with us. And then, you know, years later, um, I go to I go to a concert of uh, of my friend, big musician in Russia, I speak, this, this, this two uh, girls and a boy. Um, they, they have millions of views on YouTube and uh, they, they gather uh, big concerts with a lot of lot of teens coming to the concerts but the the moral of the story all the current musicians like i speak they were somehow influenced by pussy riot and you know people in in our movement so now they move activism further into mainstream and they actually make uh, they actually politicize all those kids who are coming to their concerts and um, you know, you, in, in politics, like a society is such a difficult uh, organism. You never can find um, straight connections between A to B. So you know, we made an action, and then now Putin is overthrown. It's it's never like that. But I like to think that we we somehow contributed. <laughs> Thank you. Do any of the caucus chairs have any follow up questions? That I have a a question in relation to defending, uh, let's say like the United States, right? I would argue that it's a pretty free country relatively to the rest of the world. Um, do you see, like what mechanism do you think is the best way to protect this level of freedom that, you, that the United States has against um, the, a movement of authoritarianism um, that could come let's say 10 years from now, 20 years from now, is it, do you, like, for example, there's a lot of arguments that, that go into the Second Amendment, which is the right to bear arms against a tyrannical government, something similar to that, or is there something else that you think is a better way to protect? 
Oh. <laughs> Here we come. <laughs> My favorite stuff. A Russian person coming to United States and teaching people from United States how to live in their country. Um, I, I think you guys know better, honestly. But um, you mentioned this uh, bearing guns thing. Um, well, again, I'm not an American, but for a person from Europe, a person from Russia, it's like it's such a such a weird thing. I cannot believe that you still can bear can have guns walking on the street. But okay, that's your thing. Um, I do not support that. Um, I think education is the biggest uh, protection for democracy always. So if you have, um, if you have access to good quality education that's available for everyone, um, this is the biggest protection you can have. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, you have a, a question as well? Yeah, just a brief one, sorry. Um, I mean, as you might be aware, this last summer in the US has been quite eventful. Um, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement and the uprisings all across the country, um, as well as COVID uh, displacing and, and um, getting millions of people um, to lose their jobs as well as even more millions to face eviction. Um, in my home city of New York, I saw, you know, along with the protests, um, along with the protests, like mutual aid networks pop up organically to kind of help fill in the gaps when the government was obviously not doing that. And also to um, give people more determination over their own communities. Do you know, is there an analogous are there analogous um, are there analogous projects in Russia that you know of? Um, I'd be curious to hear about that. Yes, um, we do have that, and I'm really proud of um, our abilities to uh, organize ourselves uh, completely horizontally without any leaders. And I think if you if you think about the you know, global protests and the global civil rights movement of 2020. Um, then uh, you think about horizontal protests, first of all. We, we do have uh, people who we, who we love, who we respect. I don't know, like Alexei Navalny or Greta Thunberg or Bernie Sanders or a AOC. Uh, but um, they're, not, they're, um, they're not our bosses, right? If, um, if one day they will, I mean, anyway, they're, it's a completely different power structure, and I feel like there is something like really, uh, really special about this uh, power dynamic in um, civil rights movement in, in 2020. Um, and I participated um, in collecting donations for and collecting funds for um, a COVID shelter for, um, uh, for shelter for domestic um, uh, for for okay shelter for women who went through domestic violence um, during COVID times. For a region in Russia that's really uh, dangerous for women, and I cannot even name this region because if I name this region, then there is a chance that authorities are going to know about it and they're going to find the region, but it's one of the uh, southern regions of Russia, um, really close to Chechnya, and they probably heard about Chechnya and how um, how dangerous it is for gay people, but also for women, because it's still really religious and really conservative and government does nothing to protect uh, women. So what we do, you know, I guess the same as you saw in New York, like when we see that uh, government is failing to protect, uh, protect our fellow citizens, then we do it by ourselves. And that's pretty difficult for us because we don't have uh, those those funds that the gover our government has, and but unfortunately they do spend on it on yachts um really ineffectively um another thing that i'm really proud of is our horizontal system of supporting each other um in difficult times of being arrested so since 2011 um uh, we in, we developed in russia really um highly uh digitalized uh really intellectual scheme of uh protecting people who end up in um, end up being arrested. 
So if you are arrested and if you have just literally one second to push one button and it, it, then the signal goes to this coordination center and next thing you know, you have lawyers coming to help you and you have food being passed to you while you sit in police department. And probably there is a group of activists outside standing with, um, with banners demanding uh, for your freedom. Um, so it's something that um, I saw uh, just growing uh, in front of my eyes. It didn't, we didn't have it in 2007 when I started to be an activist. We didn't have it in 2011 for 10 years. Um, we really grew. <laughs> That's really fascinating. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I'm going to move on to some of the questions. We have a lot of questions in the, the chat. If I don't get to your question, I apologize. There are a lot of questions. All right, so Perry Carter says, how would you describe the state of the feminist movement in Russia today? And what role do you think it, it is, can, or should play in fighting against authoritarianism? Mm -hmm. um, so our feminist movement and, and our uh, anti-authoritarian movement, they started to um, work and started to somehow merge with, with each other not that long time ago. I'd say it happened around four or five years ago. And before they existed kind of in parallel universes. And it was one of the issues that uh, uh, we, Pussy Red, when we, when we started our collective, we wanted to address because we had a lot of conversations with uh, multiple feminist groups uh, in 2010, 2011. Um, we wanted to convince them to vocally go against Putin, against Kremlin, against corruption. And they would say that it's not our issues. Um, we want to, and it made sense, right? They would, they said that like, we want to tackle just one issue because like that in, in that way we can be the most effective if we're not just you know, uh, spreading our attention on all the issues. But um, for us, it was, <laughs> for us, it was obvious that it's simple. It, it, it's kind of impossible to, um, you know, to, to make really, um, to, to make important uh, important feminist steps, uh, such as making anti-domestic violence law passed in our parliament without without pushing Putin and 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 his uh, cronies. So um, around four or five years ago, this movement started to merge, and and feminists who um, who appear like mushrooms after the rain today. We have a lot of a lot of uh, young feminists, and um, lately, uh, lately they started to be really politically active. So um, I don't know. I feel like um, I feel like I live under enormous pressure from my government, but also in 2020, I I feel like I'm living in paradise because at the same time I see um, um, I see incredible um, articulated young um, activists, and I see big promise in that. Sort of as a, a follow-up, there's a very similar question. Someone was admiring your shirt, which um, says, destroy the patriarchy on it. Um, uh, so, so what does destroy the patriarchy mean to you? And what is the connection between um, autocracy and the patriarchy? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and, and and one thing, yeah, this these questions are basically the same, right? So, uh, we had a lot of conversations within our um, our, our activist communities uh, when we just started with the right um, about bringing LGBTQ plus conversations and feminist conversations into broader anti-authoritarian um, agenda. And surprisingly, a lot of our friends. Or who happened mostly to uh, and, and those people who would tell us those such things they would all normally be men um they would tell us that it's not appropriate to bring it right now because you will scare people out and um the government television will come to our rallies and they will they will film people with um rainbow flag and they will show it to russian people and russian people will be scared of us because they will think that only freaks are coming to anti-Putin rallies and I refuse I didn't see the points because I was like why, why would I sh why would I hide my values right now for you to win 
So then later, later we can do what? Because you know, if, I feel like if um, if my values are not part of the revolution, then I don't want this revolution to happen. And that was a big part of what Pussy Riot was pushing forward. And um, I remember when we just made our action um, in Cathedral of Christ the Savior, so many people, including Alexei Navalny, they would be like, uh, we do not actually support fully Pussy Riot, but we don't think they should be in jail. And um, at that time, it was not it was not fashionable among normal anti putin leaders to be uh, for feminism and pro-LGBTQ as well. But over time, with um, with more pressure from just from just people who are constantly asking people like Alexei Navalny, like, "Hey, do you support you know uh, right of uh, same, do you support same-sex marriages and stuff like that?" Um, he he moves he moves towards more progressive values. So um, anyway, short answer to this amazing question. I believe that it's important. Uh, it's impossible for me personally to fight against autocracy without fighting for um, for feminist values. And uh, I feel a lot of problems in autocracies come from patriarchal system. Um, not necessarily only only from the system, but they are um, often connected together because it's just you know historic systems of powers that uh, went hand by hand for such a long period of time. So we have to question both of them. Thank you. Are there any follow-ups from the um, Pen Political Union caucus chairs? If no, I can move on to the next question. Awesome. All right. So um, Jen Locke uh, has a question about <laughs> nice. Uh, has a question about birthday cake. Ah, I just, I just had birthday on seventh of November, which is which happens to be a day of Russian Revolution, <laughs> and I'm still celebrating with you guys. <laughs> birthday. <laughs> so um, Jen Locke has a question about censorship within the music industry in Russia. Um, and she wants to know uh, sort of about your experiences, but also did you ever try and sign with a music label? Um, and if so, did you face a lot of rejections from the record labels because they uh, feared that they would be punished uh, for supporting an activist group? Well, in Russia, I cannot often leave my house without being arrested. So I, I clearly could not even reach people from music labels because they are really scared of, of doing, of even talking to me. So right now I'm looking for um, a, a DP in St. Petersburg because I, uh, I filmed I'm a part of like one half of music video um, in another place outside of Russia. And um, I am about to film another part of that music video in St. Petersburg. And I'm looking for a person who's just going to hold the camera, right? And none and none of the people are saying yes because they're scared. So last time when I was trying to uh, make a music video in St. Petersburg, the whole crew was uh, arrested by cops. And then the stylist with all her three suitcases of clothing, she was arrested. And me in full makeup with a white face, we, brought, we were brought to the police station. Why, you ask? Nobody knows why because I'm Pussy Red and they like they, they, they so I have like been in Russia I have hundreds of grown up men and women um, having their job like only one thing to interfere in uh, Pussy Red trying to create their art so no like, definitely I I never spoke with a record label in Russia. Um, and uh, I wouldn't because I don't want to expose uh, people to unnecessary danger. And honestly, it's it was a big it was a big pressure on me personally since I got out of jail and I knew that uh, everything I touch, I expose them to danger. Everybody I touch, uh, because often um, the government would not go against me because they know that I have protection of the international media. It doesn't mean that nothing can happen with me, but. It's not so easy because they know that then raiders will start to rage. Um, and often they would just touch my friends, um, activists or friends, musicians who decide to work with me. And so after that um, event with our arrest in St. Petersburg, a few people who gave us a place to film, they lost their studio just because they, they gave Pussy Red access to film in their studio. 
So no, no record labels in Russia. And I spoke with a bunch of record labels in uh, the United States, but um, I did not enjoy those conversations a lot. Um, I spoke with majors, I spoke with uh, smaller labels, but um, we couldn't find, I don't know, common ground, I guess. They were kind of scared of politics. I mean, like labels are saying, labels are uh, entities that are here to make money, first of all. And a lot of them, they do have financial financial interests in Russia. Some of them, like Warner Brothers, um, uh, the head of, uh, the, the main investor of uh, Warner Brothers, Leonid Blavatnik, he has his um, inter financial interest in a gale, a oil and gas industry in Russia. So he literally said, uh, Pussy Red is going to be signed uh, in my record label over my dead body. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm self-released. Uh, by the way, go to my Patreon and subscribe to uh, subscribe to monthly donations. <laughs> I support that. Um, okay. So um, uh, Ryan Martin has a, a question. Um, uh, Ryan asks, "Would you consider like running for political office or or?" entering politics to enact change from the inside? Um, or do you believe that you're more effective as an activist um, calling upon politicians to do better? Mm. Whew. Um, if only I could. Um, as for now, I'm a person who was in jail for 10 years from uh, since, I mean, yeah, for two more years, I cannot run. But then after, maybe. Um, so I'm not saying no. This is, uh, this is an interesting opportunity, but also I've, I don't have any particular plans, but um, I, I really respect those people who, who do that. And uh, I think maybe one day uh, I'll run for an office as well. Okay. Um, so uh, Perry Carter has another question. Um, so why do you think that the Russian opposition leader um, uh, Alexei Navalny was uh, poisoned, and what does his poisoning mean for the chances of a democratic transition in Russia in the near future? Um, well, his poisoning gave him more chances to become the next president of Russia because it was like <laughs> he, he almost became an unofficial president of Russia after he was poisoned because by doing that, um, our our um, our government gave him incredible power. They um, they signed on a piece of paper saying that Alexei Navalny is the most effective and the most popular oppositional leader in in Russia today, and he grew a lot. And knowing him, um, knowing him publicly, knowing him personally, I know that he's going to use it with um, with wisdom. All right. Um, so, so this question is sort of about, um, in, in the U.S. we have a lot of like late night shows, news shows, um, and related media that have started capitalizing on political outrage. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on this? Is, is there any merit or um, is it just another type of half-hearted performance? Do you think they actually mean what they're saying? Do you think that the news show hosts are, are just doing it for the, the money? Um, that was from Dylan Cook. Well, I don't really watch them, so I, I'm not really sure that I'm the right person to answer this question, but generally, I feel it's a generally good when you have different sources of information and different opinions, different angles, and different ways how to uh, give information to the people, like, uh, you know, some of them can be with humor and satire, and that's that's generally cool. Uh, I mean, the, um, the problem I see is when um, media companies are driven mostly by profits and less by their desire to spread um, truth. That's, that's the problem, but it's, it's not specifically about late night shows. Before I forget to ask, do any of the caucus chairs have any follow-up questions or any questions um, that they want? Yes, Javier. 
Um, where do you get your, your courage from? Because I think that you're a very courageous person. Um, although I, I, I don't think we'll agree on everything, right? Like nobody, nobody agrees on everything, but you can, admire, you can admire someone's courage. Um, do you get this courage from your convictions and your beliefs or were you always from a young age kind of outspoken and, um, brave? I was really, I uh, was a really shy person when I was a kid. And um, the only one time when my parents um, were asked to go to school um, and I was really scared. Um, the teacher told my mom that you have to convince your daughter to speak sometimes because she cannot leave like that. She's too shy, she never speaks. <laughs> so I don't know what happened <laughs> with me. I'm still shy, but when it comes to, you know, an event like like we have right now, we, we share our views and it, it, it doesn't matter if we share or no, so we share our views. Um, courage, um, hmm, you know, uh, I think it comes a lot from community and early on I, I ended up in activist community and I wanted to be a part of activist community and um, it seemed to me um, romantic at first right um you know obviously like for every 17 years old like we want to be surrounded by courageous people with uh, ideals and who, who are ready to go to prison or die for their beliefs and um i found those people and so then when you're surrounded by by really um, by people who are driven by their artistic and um, activist goals then it's just like easy you're you're part of it um and you kind of give each other energy and, and regarding um, our disagreement and some political beliefs, I think that's really cool that we are all here together. It's, it's, it's so important and crucial for us to, to, to come together because that's the problem of uh, modern society that we are really actually listen to each other. And that was a thing that I learned about in prison, weirdly, uh, because before I was totally living in my leftist progressive, um, you know, um, I know Bohemian, um, poor student bubble. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really, I wasn't even aware about the existence of other people. And then I ended up in jail. And actually, I, I met people from all the different backgrounds. And I, I realized that actually I can be uh, friends with a person who is, oh my God, is a Putin supporter. And we still share some basic human values. And we, we still believe in the same you know, kindness, kindness is kindness, doesn't matter who you support, Putin or Trump. I mean, it's not ideal for me, but like, I still can be a friend. <laughs> and I think we, we need to, we need to remember it. And I constantly remind myself about this revelation that came to me in prison. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think that's highly uh, warranted that um, you mentioned the need for unity uh, rather than division, uh, because living in the U.S., especially in Phil in Philly, um, I mean, there was two protests back to back um, during the summer months. So, you know, I want to say thank you for that. I miss Philly. <laughs> I wish I could come in person. Well, when whenever you have the chance, just let us know. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. Uh, I, I have a question, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you have a, a young daughter. Um, how much of your, your activism and um, striving for, for a different Russia has been influenced by having a young daughter? Um, um, yeah, it was influenced. Uh, at first, it was influenced kind of selfishly because I was... Um, I was struck with the amount of sexism that I met when I became a young mother and I was totally thrown out um, away from, from, from all the circles I've been before. I was 18 years old when I, um, when I got my baby and, and, and obviously at 18 years old, you are not prepared for being like, just like treated just as mother. I mean, nobody has to be treated just as a mother because they're, we're, on, like, we're still keeping our roles. We're still having our brains. We're full human beings, right? And I thought like as a part of, um, you know, progressive, I don't know, left, somehow left-oriented art collective, 
I would not experience these issues, but I did. So it actually, uh, you know, her appearance in my life made me more convicted feminist. And because of selfish reasons, but also because of the reasons that uh, I want to I want to see her uh, living in a little bit better country than I uh, live in, and I wanted to explain her why I um, why I'm an activist, and I think I did. I did it really good. <laughs> so now she she's an activist. She's preaching at her school um, about feminism and uh, LGBTQ to her um, mates. She's uh, running around with the rainbow flag, which is like com has completely different meaning in Russia. I mean, it's like much, much more dangerous. You can actually be arrested for running with a rainbow flag. It sounds like she she shares your your bravery. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I I hope so. Um, I know. Um, well, definitely, I'm not the most conventional mother. That's for sure. But so far, she seems to be fine with that. <laughs> Because, you know, sometimes I'm like, I'm being like, I, I'm super honest with her and I'm like, yeah, I mean, I know that I'm not around for a lot of time because I, I travel and like I record music here and there and, you know, I was in prison for two years. So I wasn't, I wasn't around all the time, but I was like, I mean, what, what would you honestly, what would you prefer if I would be a dissatisfied 31 years old who like didn't leave any life and just like just was sitting at home all, all the life I, and I would be with you like 24 7 or you want to have this like crazy mother who can talk with you about like literally everything and she's like oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> she kind of she kind of likes me right now but she's 12 so we'll ask her when she will be 15 it will be a rebellious age <laughs> Haven, you unmuted. Did you did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, um, do you think that you picked up stuff from other kind of campaigns for democracy, uh, 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 like, all over the world? Like, what kind of like did you draw inspiration from other movements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, from uh, from Zapatistas, Zapatistas. Um, um, and we we took her mask from them from this you know mexican movement for for liberation of chiapas um then definitely both ukrainian revolutions in 2004 and 2013 um definitely seriously inspired us um belarus recently um and arab spring in 2011 and when i got rid of mubarak um, it was it was a big event in my life somehow because I thought oh look like so maybe one day we will we will wake up and there is no Putin anymore. Another question is what what happened after the Arab Spring um, and that um, th that is it was a bigger question it was a question that actually made us scream stronger about our feminist and LGBTQ values uh, while be, while making the revolution to be sure that we are not will we will not end up within um in the government with more backwards values after the revolution and suffragette movement i mean like the whole feminist movement for sure of course yeah and and uh, obviously russian dissidents um uh, when i was in jail what really brought like what, what kept my spirit alive uh is uh, memoirs of russian dissidents Um, could you talk about like, uh, like what it means for someone like, like, what do you think people who are in other countries could take from your, like, take from your activism? Hmm. <laughs> you mean from, uh, was it right in particular or, or from Russian activism? Anything that like, like, I guess Russian activism in general or anything you're involved in. Mm-hmm. Um, well, okay, from Pissaret is, um, I guess it, it, it's helpful to be somehow naive and stupid. It actually helped to impl amplify your voice because when we started our band, we didn't know how to play the guitar. And now the whole world believes, believes for whatever reason that uh, we are a band and we are, we are being invited to festivals. Like um, 
Glastonbury and stuff like that. So I think um, it, it, arrogance to some point is, is a good thing, but also like, you know, arrogance that doesn't harm anyone because we, we, um, we didn't harm any people or property. We were just like loud, naive, stupid, and courageous, I guess. <laughs> so um, using art generally is, I guess, would be my, my biggest advice. I wish I saw more um, political art emerging um, over the last four years, four years in the United States. I saw a lot of artists uh, making political statements. Uh, I didn't see that many artists making actually political art, but when they did, it actually, it, it worked well. Like, you know, like, like this is America music video. Um, I wish there were more This Is America music videos in the United States, but uh, maybe, maybe they're to come. Um, I think this is incredibly, um, th this is incredibly helpful in making a political protest popular and uh, making people, um, how to say it, shit, I forgot this English word. Um, anyway, it is something, it is, uh, it is something that um, we always had as a goal to make our cutting edge ideas more a little bit more mainstream and i think art is a good way to seduce people in your cutting edge ideas michael go ahead yep yeah um so i guess going to the like more abstract political um how do you how effective do you view um sanctions and similar tools of the US government in, in um, dealing with authoritarian governments. I mean, you know, there's, there are people who thought we'd be greeted as liberators and in this country or another if we invaded. And there seems to be an escalation and kind of Cold War-esque rhetoric around both Russia and China. Do you think something like, you know, um, an increase in financial or even military action of, of the United States in Russia would help or hinder the um, people's revolt? Um, no, but why would, uh, why would the United States even think about uh, military inter intervention in another country? I, I think um, the United States has to forget this role of the world policeman. It's so outdated. Um, you know, um, it's it's our um, it's our country and it's our choice. If we, you know, if we want to live with an autocrat, we we can live with an autocrat. Um, so uh, generally, regarding sanctions, uh, I support sanctions against um, against individuals who are proven to be um, to to make crimes against humanity, uh, crimes against human rights. Like, um, you know, like that uh, Magnitsky Act that was started uh, by William Browder. Um, and I supported that and I even traveled to Washington to, um, to ask the Senate to add more names to that act. Um, those people who were in charge of mistreating uh, Pussy Riot and other political prisoners in jail. So I think sanctions against guys like Putin, against um, other oligarchs from Russia and um, heads of prisons uh, who are proven to violate human rights, it's, it's a good thing. Because for um, most of Russian elites, um, their life interests, they do not lie, lie within Russia. They want to take as, many, as much money they can from Russia and travel abroad to have luxury villa somewhere in Italy or Switzerland uh, or um, London, right? Uh, unfortunately for us, Western governments, they didn't pay enough attention on, on where this dirty money come from. And um, often it's, uh, it's, it's money that, uh, this basically, basically it's money that comes from corruption and from, from stealing from Russian people. So I, I wish Western governments would pay, pay attention on that. But when it comes to sanctions against sectors of economy or against uh, normal, ordinary Russian citizens, I'm strictly against it because it's something that actually harm, will harm Russian people 
and that will make Russian people sure that the United States is the enemy of Russia and that Putin is right and they need to support Putin in his fight against NATO and against um, the United States. So um, yeah, when when it comes to ordinary Russian people, I think like again like anything, um, education is a good thing because uh, for um, the way if you want to help if you want to help to democratize to make Russia more democratic, I I think the best way to do that is to go with information with funding media outlets inside Russia with funding um, NGO that work um, that that are funded by local people inside Russia um, and um, and help Russian people with education and it, it's like such an easy thing as just giving um, access to free courses of English language somewhere in provincial city of Russia would uh, turn so many Russian people towards the United States. Um, I think just being useful is, is a good strategy. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, there's a couple com comments coming in. We only have about 10 or so more minutes left. Um, uh, but yes, I'll try and get through some more comments, uh, some more questions. Um, so do you see parallels in American authoritarianism um, and the collapse of American imperialism and the coup that Trump and Republicans are currently engaged in? So do you see these parallels in Russia? Um, I don't think I'm educated enough about our American political system to talk about it. Um, and then another question is um, uh, from Andreas uh, Hapsch, which is, uh, you mentioned that the U.S. should not be intervening militarily in uh, countries under authoritarian rule, um, in other countries under authoritarian rule. Coming from someone in from Venezuela, uh, uh, would you be open to the U.S. intervening in a country ruled by a dictatorship in which the majority of the people clearly do not support and are fighting to get rid of their dictator? Huh. Um, I do not. I do not see why why United States would be able to decide that. I mean, like if if an organization such as uh, United Nations will decide that there is a. Um, there is a genocide or, uh, you know, extreme violations of human rights is happening and they will decide to intervene. There will be one thing, but if it's just the United States, I don't even know, like, if it's, if it's legal under the international law. Is it? I'm not sure. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> I mean, like, why, <laughs> why didn't the United States intervene in Los Angeles? city jail i've been there i've been there not as a not as a person who's been arrested but i i was there uh, with human rights inspection and they have like super thin blankets and almost no pillows and the food there i was like hey can i try the food and they were like yeah this is burrito and i was like this is burrito this is like just a ah uh, uh, this is terrible i mean like i i, I really wish an american administration would <laughs> interfere in affairs of uh, LA city jail. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Is there any oil in the Los Angeles city jail, perchance? <laughs> I don't know. Or we have to dig. We have All to right, dig. All right, then we don't again. have any. <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> okay, so so another question is from Dan Romer. Um, I, are you, you're aware that Edward Snowden is living in Russia, right? Edward Snowden's like a U.S. People, the, the U.S. government wants to arrest Edward Snowden and whatnot. I know him. Uh, what? <laughs> I know him, yeah. <laughs> um, do you think, why, why do you Almost think... Almost personally. Oh. Almost. 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 <laughs> Almost. Um, so what do you make of him living in Russia? And do you think that Putin finds him useful in some way? Like, what, what is the the perspective of someone who is Russian? Uh, well, Snowden recently um, was a really strict, uh, would say, say something really strict against the Russian government. Uh, he condemned the, the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, 
which was, I think, the first time when uh, Snowden said something publicly against Putin, um, which was, I think, extremely, incredibly brave of him. So, yeah, that I mean, he, he, he does what he, he can, right? Like, he, there, there, is no, there is not a lot of countries where he can go when he's the enemy of the United States. And I'm a supporter of Edward Snowden, and I want him to be safe. And it doesn't mean that being like with Russian FSB agents means being safe, but it's definitely safer than to be in um, in an American jail. Fair. <laughs> um, do any of the caucus chairs have follow-up questions or any questions left that they would like to ask? I had another question. Um, yeah. If you don't mind him. him. Um, so you talked a few times about education and education, you know, is obviously one of the, you know, surest ways to, you know, help society generally. But I was curious, sort of, what has your experience been as someone you know, who's educated in Russia, who has a, a daughter who is being educated in Russia? What is the sort of Russian school system look like? Because while school can also teach you to think, it also, you know, they can teach history in a certain way. They could, you know, put certain ideas in children. You know, the state education can be an instrument both of learning and indoctrination. So I guess, what is your general thoughts about um, sort of anything I'd be interested to know about the Russian uh, education system and how it uh, plays out in, you know, when the children grow up and go into society and enter politics uh, in some mm -hmm. Um Well, I think um, every institution um, is um, biased somehow towards like one idea or another and, um, and, and Definitely, it's true about the Russian uh, Russian state. Um, it was not the case when I was studying in Russian school. It was completely different. I mean, we did not any have um, ideology that they were trying to put in our heads, right at the time. Um, but it uh, it has changed lately, and they they introduced this um, lessons of religious education which basically is nothing because like, you know, I have to know about Russian government that uh, a lot of things that they're doing, they sound incredible, uh, but in fact, they're the same, they're, they're nothing. Like, even if you look at those Facebook posts um, um, against Hillary Clinton, I mean, a lot of them, they were just, you know, straight dumb. <laughs> um, uh, and the same with this religious lessons, um, they just put, I don't know, a person who is normally uh, teaching geography and they tell her, look, like you have to like one, one time a week to pretend that you are teaching religion. And she's not even a religious person. She never opened the Bible or any religious scripture. And she's like, um, I don't know, I guess I'll, I'll have to do something. So it's, it's mostly like this bureaucratic procedures. And you know, sometimes they have Putin's portrait on the wall and and sometimes uh, the teacher would be like uh, you know just talking half of the half of the lesson instead of talking about geography she would be like oh yeah Putin is a great leader he's saving you from 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 United States but um uh, but mostly it's just um uh, it just comes down to teachers not doing their jobs really properly uh, it's not like the massive government propaganda we don't have like any of that really we don't even have to sing an, uh, a national anthem when we start the day <laughs> so um it's mostly to me the question mostly about the quality of education and the quality is dropping because um the state is not able to pay um like real money to the teachers so so people who really have aspirations and who are really smart they're not um they're not teaching at school and so people who, who are living there like who, who decide to be in school they they're there not because they want to teach but because they have no place to go and the same about um this is the same about russian cops um my daughter this year we moved to um a private school for the first year um <laughs> Uh, and this school is different because um, in that school, um, most of the kids, they do not support Putin, but some of them do support Trump. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's very interesting. <laughs> when it comes to higher education, um, mm -hmm. it's it's more difficult because I, I noticed a lot of censorship uh, in 
So, um, I mean, the history of humanitarian knowledge in Russia is really, um, really sad because um, humanitarian part of our um, science was, if you call it science, it was basically destroyed during Soviet Union. Um, all the people were, uh, all the smart people, I mean, all the philosophers uh, and uh, historians, they had to leave Russia after 1917. And so we have this really weird tradition based in this mar uh, weirdly understood Marxism. Marxism-Leninism, it's called. Anyway, it's, it's pretty fucked up when it comes to higher education and you choose to study humanitarian class. And also there is this new censorship coming from our current government, um, which basically says not do not talk, talk about anything you want, but do not talk bad things about Putin and do not talk about gay people. And it were two things that I was interested in talking at my philosophy classes. So um, it was pretty challenging time for me. Okay, so I think that that wraps up our um, event. Um, it's, it's almost time anyway, but I would like to uh, reiterate my thanks to everyone who um, has uh, shown up, all the attendees, all the caucus chairs, and especially to Nadia, thank you so much for, for coming and joining us at the Union. Um, this was a wonderful event. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was really thank enjoyable. You. Thank you, Nadia. It thank was you. great. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Bye.